Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I see some people joining. Thank you for being here today. We'll get started in just a minute. Hi everybody, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks for being here today. I see some more people joining in. We'll get started in just a minute. Hey Dan, let's, uh, let's get started because we're at 9 right, We love to start things on time. Um, <laughs> so if you're just joining us, thank you. Um, welcome to today's webinar, 100% wellness. Uh, we're so excited for this event. We've been waiting for it. We have a great lineup of panelists today. Uh, but before we jump in, uh, for those who are new to Kire, I just wanted to give a quick overview because Kire provides great looking architectural design elements that are easy to understand, specify and install, are made from recycled content, and improve the acoustics and functionality of any room. Today we're excited to share Kire Inc., our latest print collection, so I'm going to hand that off to Deanne Padone, Kire's awesome product manager, uh, to give us a little bit more information on that collection before we get into the discussion um, that was inspired by this collection. Deanne? Awesome. Thanks, Anne. Let's get to it. So Kire Inc. Launching with a curated library of 48 prints over four collections, Curie Inc. delivers endless customization possibilities through colors, patterns, graphics, and materials. So from spectacular statement walls to custom matched color, designers can make rooms sound as good as they look with designs as original as their clients. So this is our most recent product launch in October um, that we launched with the team here at Curie in San Diego. And I'll take you through a little overview today before we get started. So looking for inspiration, we've got you covered. Uh, Curie Inc. Is, has launched with 48 prints curated into these four collections, geo, wood, natural materials, and biophilia. Uh, today, we will be touching on wood and natural materials uh, as they do correlate with biophilic design, but we'll definitely have a larger emphasis on our biophilia collection. Starting with wood, this is a popular one. Uh, the warmth of natural wood with the acoustic performance of PET. So we love the look that natural wood brings to a space, but those hard surfaces can be tough on the ears. So even more difficult can be sourcing wood sustainably as all of us designers know. Um, our printed wood collection gives you the look on acoustic PET made from 60% post-consumer recycled material. So here's just a quick look at the six uh, or the five woods that we are offering in our woods collection. Uh, these are fun full grain panels. So really beautiful when they're installed on a wall. Next up, we have natural materials. So of course, easy on the eye and the ear, the look of concrete and marble without the echoes. Um, all of the beauty of natural stone, but light as a feather. So that was really what we were going for for this collection. Here are the five prints that we have in our natural materials collection, some linen, grass cloth, and of course those harder surfaces, Calcutta, travertine, and concrete. And then why we are all here today is to talk about biophilia and biophilic design. So florals, re leaf repeats, and nature, this isn't your grandma's wall covering. Uh, bring outside to the inside with our biophilia inspired prints. And with our low VOC, VOC PET panels, it's okay to breathe a little deeper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tea leaf, um, this is 
one of our prints in our biophilia collection. So I'm going to go through them all pretty quickly here, just so you have an idea of what we're offering. This is a beautiful print, obviously super oversized leaf uh, with panels along the back wall there. It's, it's really fun and graphic. Sandstorm in color. So this obviously gives so much texture to a wall, really beautiful in color. And we also offer it in the black and white version as well. Cut stems is a fun one. This is offered in color with that green, uh, really takes the spin on that chinoiserie, which is really popular in residential and hospitality design right now. And then of course we also offer it in black and white, which is super fun and graphic. Next, we have clear water, one of my favorites. Uh, this is clear water reflection. It's really beautiful um, when applied to different products and spaces, really zen feeling. Here we have tree rings. So this is a take on um, essentially tree rings in a more graphic way. So that little, it's printed on a gray panel with that white ink and it's, it's really fun. Here is succulent wall. This one's obviously a statement piece, but beautiful take on, on a succulent wall um, in a more graphic way, which we really love. These prints can be applied to many of our Curie products as well. So this is clear water printed on our Curie Echo Star. So I love the reflection the water gives on the ceiling. It's so beautiful. Here is a lineup of all of our prints offered in our biophilia collection. And here's just a beautiful image of the samples that we have available for biophilia. And Deanne, just so people understand the scale, what, what size are those panels? The panels are 48 by uh, 108. So they're full size four by nine sheets. Um, and these, these are just small little snips of the samples that you see in this image here, but they're, they're full wall panels. So Curie Inc. is printed on our recycled PET panels, as we mentioned, and of course, boosts environmental certifications, including Declare, Red List Free, we have an HPD, and, our obvious, and of course, they're low VOC. Um, but remember, not all PET is created equal. So watch out for the fine print. Uh, Curie's PET products are made from 60% recy post-consumer recycled content, plastics. So you can be sure that every panel you specify is diverting hundreds of plastic bottles from oceans and landfills. Quick touch on spec details. Um, they're printed, Curie ink prints are printed using water-soluble ProGraphic UV ink that is GreenGuard certified. These LED inks contain less than 0.03% of volatile organic compounds and are void of heavy metals. So even our ink we're being conscious about when printing on these panels. Um, of course, a little touch on cleanability. They can be lightly clean using, using ammonia-free Windex or a few drops of dish soap per gallon of water. Of course, don't wanna scrub too hard as, as there is ink on there. And of course, they're easy to install. So this is a live shot of our cut stems in black and white. The pattern repeatabil repeatability on these is top notch. It's, it's perfect repeats from panel to panel. You can go up and down, side to side, and really get that whole uh, graphic wall that you're looking for, regardless of the size of your space. And of course, 100% custom. So we have the printer here in house in San Diego. So a lot of custom projects we've already seen come through, which is awesome. We can print full bleed colors, we can print logos, we can print uh, wayfinding signs, anything that a, really a designer would be looking for, we can print for you. Um, so super excited to have this in house in San Diego, print on demand, anything you want, we can, we can make happen. Some other tools, inspiration, of course, to see more, go view uh, the collection, all the collections at curiausa.com slash curieinc. Our digital lookbook, our marketing teammate is amazing. There's a link to it there. If you wanna breeze through that and take a look as well. And then of course we have Revit files available for all these curating prints as well.
All right, thanks for sitting through that little product overview. Um, I now have the pleasure of passing this over to Michael DeTullo. Michael has been designing iconic products for some of the world's biggest brands for more than 20 years. He has worked with Nike, Google, Honda, Converse, Motorola, and has been collaborating with Cure since 2019, leading the creative process for product development and marketing. He has sat on the Ascension Board to the SF MoMA and the Board of Directors for the Design Foundation. His work has been featured in publications like Metropolis and Wallpaper, and he is listed on over 30 patents and has won numerous awards, including the IDSA's Special Achievement Award for contributions to the design industry. Curie is proud to have collaborated with Michael on Curie Inc., and we are excited to have him here as our panel host today. Thanks, Deanne. Um, I just want to say I've been working with Curie for about four years now across product development and, and marketing creative. And uh, I just, I love, I've, I've worked in a lot of different industries. Uh, I've worked in footwear for a long time and designed everything from watches to, to speedboats. And one of the things I love about working in the architecture and design industry is that my, my customers are designers. And so it's just such an honor to design a product that then other creative people take and make things that I would never have thought of with those products. Um, and so I just love seeing, you know, a year, two years, even five years after a launch, like new things get designed with products that we worked on. Uh, so it's an honor to be here speaking with you all. I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce uh, our panelists. We have three amazing designers with us today. Uh, who have worked um, on a wide variety of projects to talk about uh, how biophilia influences their work. Uh, Sonia is our, our first panelist. Sonia, do you want to um, say a few words about, about yourself, where you're sure. coming to us from? All right. Well, hello, everyone. I am so happy to be joining you today. My name is Sonia Bocart, and I'm joining you from the beautiful and rainy Sonoran Desert today. So this is the ancient tribal lands of the Ookam, the Yavapai, and the Odom people. I am a director with Shepley Bullfinch. Uh, we were founded in 1874, and we are the longest practicing architecture firm in the US. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have five offices nationwide. Uh, we focus on healthcare, education, urban development, um, in interiors. And at Shepley, I, I help to direct Lens. So we have a, a, a group that's committed to design strategy, innovation, and research. And we're, con we're really committed to helping our communities to flourish. Shown here are some of our recent higher education projects. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I have about 25 years experience, including um, 12 recent years as a biophilia and regenerative design consultant. I lead project visioning and experiential workshops. Um, I've consulted on a number of living building challenge projects around the nation, and I've worked in collaboration with a number of manufacturers, including Lululemon and HMTX Industries, um, and I'm also an educator. Um, in essence, I would say that I am inspired to create more wellness and healing in the world through the instrument of design. Um, so thank you so much for having me today. Thanks for joining, Sonia. Super excited to have you a part of the conversation. Uh, our next designer is Emmy. Emmy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, hi, everyone. Happy to be joining today. My name is Emmy Funk. A um, little different than Sonia, I am here in New York City, very dense uh, urban place. Um, I am I'm a sustainability analyst with HLW um, on our Beyond team. So a little bit of background, HLW is a global architect, architecture and design firm based in New York City with offices across the country and globally. Um, but something a little bit unique um, about me and my team, so I work on an Kind of HLW's internal sustainability team called Beyond. Um, so kind of this unique situation where we are an internal sustainability consulting team kind of sitting within this larger architecture and design firm. Um, so, so we work on a range of projects with different sustainability and health and wellness goals, and that can be consulting on um, you know, third-party rating systems such as LEED, Well, FitWell, 
um, or tailored sustainability approaches. So helping projects, you know, whether it's decarbonization in the built environment, whether it's looking at different health and wellness strategies that projects can, can try and incorporate in their design. Um, we we kind of cover a wide range of different uh, sustainability and wellness um, objectives for clients. Um, and then something unique too, I'm, being part of an architecture and design firm, um, although not we're not necessarily the designers on the project, we have this opportunity to work really closely with our design teams, um, which, which really helps try and incorporate more of the sustainability and wellness goals, like from the beginning of the project throughout, you know, all the way through even like post-occupancy. Um, so um, we work on a you know, wide range of projects ranging from interior commercial fit outs to uh, new construction and higher education and commercial, um, even working on um, kind of built projects, trying to retroactively go back and see how we can implement health and wellness in the built environment. So um, actually one of the projects up here is just an example of that. Um, this is a project that Beyond got to work on, it, it, um, not designed by HLW, but we, we had a chance to collaborate with Audible and in their New Jersey campus. So, so Audible um, kind of built out their, their campus in, um, in Jersey, in um, Newark, in this community in, Jer in Newark. And one of their big priorities was establishing this connection with the local environment and establishing this sense of place um, for their projects. So um, this is Audible's Innovation Cathedral. Um, they, they took a historic landmark church in, in Newark and converted it into this beautiful um, uh, recording studio and an office location. Um, and so it's, it's a good example, actually, of some non-traditional biophilic strategies. Um, so, you know, trying to go back and retroactively implement sustainability and wellness can be a challenge, but you can see there's all these beautiful facets of biophilia kind of already incorporated in this beautiful historic place. Um, there's geometric patterns in the stained glass windows. There's this beautiful complexity in the wood grave engravings um, across the site. Um, you can see here there's this incredible organ that they actually kept and preserved in the, in the Innovation Cathedral. Um, and then I actually just recently learned about this um, new pattern of biophilic design called the sense of awe. That's that feeling when you walk into this like incredible, you know, overwhelmingly beautiful space and you're, you just have this feeling and emotion of, of wonder and joy and um, creates kind of this, this physical sensation. So this, you know, not typically what we think of a biophilic design, but, but was such a, an amazing project. Um, and kind of shows these other elements to, to biophilia that we typically don't think of. So excited to be talking more about this topic today with everyone. So awesome. Thank you so much, Emmy. I think it's it is important to think about you know different ways you know, bio, biophilia filter into things and, and you know finding unexpected ways that are beyond just a, a pattern, right? So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um our our last panelist has has been with us before, and she was so awesome. We wanted to ask her to come back. Um, Lizzie, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been working on. Thank you so much. So I'm Lizzie Garrock, and I work with Gresham Smith in our Life and Workplaces Studio in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Gresham Smith does have 25 offices that are scattered across the country, but I'm here in our headquarter office. And I primarily focus on advancing workplaces. So I do have a background as a sustainable design consultant, and I just love bringing that lens to each project of introducing those layers of sustainability and wellness as we're approaching new workplace design. Um, this image on the screen is a rendering, but this project example was an atrium space that was existing as a vacant space. And we were looking for ways to revitalize and reactivate this space. And this rendering represents um, that shaded panel actually became a custom acoustic screen that spans 50 feet from floor to ceiling and has a waving waterfall effect the way that the panels are cut and sandwiched together. Um, so this was a really fun project to introduce that sort of biophilic pattern and context and focal point right at the heart of the space, building energy around that. Um, you can also see all of the natural daylighting and we also introduce custom plantings within this project. So even in workplace design where spaces tend to feel very corporate, it's just exciting to reintroduce nature and bring that level of detail into these projects. So the next project. 
Um, I work with a lot of clients who are making a big change. That's part of my role as strategist. And for this particular client, they wanted to recreate community. So as they returned to the workplace post-pandemic, um, we had to you know, really brainstorm on what will draw people together. And so they landed on a large work cafe, which we see in a lot of our projects, and then this interconnecting stair. And as part of that interconnecting stair, it's both an activity hub, but also not wanting to disrupt. So again, it, it resulted in this large custom acoustic feature that's running on that surface wall area that's also a three-story installation. Um, so really so much emphasis on acoustics these past few years. So much of the transition back to work has been about comfort and experience in the space and how that's linked to people's, um, the sound and activity around them. So we're seeing a lot more of that. And next slide. And then lastly, um, this is one of my latest projects. It's really exciting to see how much our designs have advanced in these past five years with the pandemic and the acceleration of so many facets of design. So for this particular client, we've started to lean much more hospitality focused, much more experiential. You can see there's more pattern, there's more happening in the space, more natural materials, more plants and greenery. And um, this is just exciting for us that we're starting to hear that more regularly for each of our projects. It's no longer the exception, it's now becoming the rule. So um, it's been a really fun time to design and get to bring more of that to the table. Yeah, I think that's really important to underline, Lizzie, that, um, you know, I think the workspace obviously is changing and you know, companies are are asking people to come back to the office in some cases, and um, it's a lot easier if that's a, a a pull rather than a push. You know, instead of making people come back, if you can create a space where people want to come back. Uh, I worked at at Nike for for seven eight years. Uh, the campus there is amazing, but they they took the opportunity in the pandemic to actually revamp a lot of buildings, and since they were were empty, a, a task that would have been really difficult to do while they were at full occupancy. And, you know, I think I was just out there for, for meetings a couple of weeks ago and just like blown away with the changes there where they're trying to create this, this place that people just, you know, instead of making people come back, creating these spaces where people want to be in. And, you know, obviously I think biophilia can be a big part of that. Um, but before we get into you know, talking how about how biophilia impacts our projects and our in our work. What I'd love to do is just get a few thoughts from from all of you on the topic. You know, I think it's a word that gets passed around a lot. It's like you know, it's in many a trend article over the last two to three years. Uh, and so, as a as a baseline for what we're talking about, would love to hear about you know what what does it mean to you? Let let's start let's start with you, Emmy. What is what does biophilia mean to you? Yeah, what a what a what a first question. Um, I think for me, like biophilia, when you actually look at the 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 foundations of it, it it is inherently people focused. It's about designing for people, and you know I think it, it's so in, intrinsic. If if you look at the the practices and the principles, you kind of like it seems simple, but it's it's things that we should be doing in our design that that for whatever reason we haven't. And it all comes back to this innate connection between people and the built environment. And we've done kind of a good job isolating ourselves from our, from our sorry, not the built environment, our, um, built, our, our humans to the natural world. Um, and we've done a good job kind of isolating ourselves for, through, um, through poor design decisions, um, sea of white walls and, and uh, bad, acoustic, you know, loud acoustics and, and open floor plans. But, um, you know, I think in in terms of um, trying to reestablish that connection, and and it 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 not, doesn't just impact our health. I know I know we've been talking about you know a lot of the themes are um, bringing it back to how our spaces impact our well being and health. Um, but I think from you know I I saw this in the fourteen patterns of biophilic design and just thought this was such a wonderful line. It's it's about designing places that people love. Um, 
that's that should never be an exception. That should just be the rule. We, we should design places that people love, um, that foster this connection to the natural world, um, which also has a ton of implication in terms of sustainability and sustainable development and, and how people and cultural attitudes towards climate change and sustainability movements. When, when we bring that connection of society back to um, back to our natural worlds, we're, we're not just impacting our health and well-being, but we're also impacting holistic sustainability. Um, so I think that, that, you know, it, for me, it's such an important topic. It tends to get kind of put into the separate bucket instead of looked at holistically with sustainability and then health design. Um, so the, the fact that everyone, so many people are excited about it and that we're here talking about it today, it means a lot to me personally and too, in, in terms of the work that we, my team does and, and at HLW, so. Okay, so there's so many things in there, <laughs> uh, but I wrote down, we'll come back to them. Uh, but but I want to make sure we hit our, our other two panelists first. Um, but that's a really some really interesting takes on it. Um, Sonia, what do you think? What is what does that word mean to you and and the way you you work? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Emmy, I loved how you uh, described that. So I'm just gonna kind of grow that or build upon that a little bit. Um, when I'm talking to people about biophilia, I always remind them that this is love of life. Um, from Eric Fromm's uh, first coining of the term, it's our passionate love of life. Um, so for me, I think um, it's that spirit of place that Dr. Stephen Keller mentioned. I mean, to me, that's one of the most prominent patterns. We can do so much with fostering connection and space, but if it doesn't elicit the spirit of place, I think we're not at our full potential. And for me, one of the reasons why I do land acknowledgements when I introduce myself is that I think it is a lot about deep cultural connection, remembering who we are. Indigenous people really know and understand that inherently. So for me, I think so much of biophilic design is just really remembering who we are. Um, and in addition to just that, I think we sometimes run the risk of thinking of ourselves a lot with biophilic design, that human health and wellness. But to me, the... Um, one of the really interesting aspects about biophilic design is the research that's starting to demonstrate that when we experience biophilic design patterns, that we are more apt or more willing to be generous, to be caring, to create, like understand a sense of place and to really um, be better stewards for the earth because our planet needs a lot of healing. Um, so I think it's a, just a beautiful, wonderful strategy and I'm really glad we're here discussing it today. Yeah, I think that's a really important point on kind of the, the psychological influences that that being in a, in a space can can have on us. And um, my my wife and partner who did her master's thesis on, on that topic of like how a, a particular space um, influences us. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that, you know, white a white echoey wall with a drop ceiling and fluorescence, people probably not going to be super happy to be in that space uh, eight to 10 hours a day for their their whole working life. Um, but, you know, how can we play? Obviously, we can improve it, but to what end and, and how can we push the boundaries of that? It's super interesting. Um, Lizzie, how about how about for you? How does does biophilia come into the the way you work and what does it mean to you? Oh, my goodness. Well, Obviously, everything that's been said, I'm fully aligned with those responses, which were so great. I think just building on that, um, Sonia, you remember you mentioned remembering who we are. And I think so much of what we're seeing now in workplace design comes back to being allowed and bringing your whole self to work, like the awareness and the acceptance of that that's really come front and center, the focus on mental health and well-being and that it's not just about what we enjoy, the biophilia in this space, it's truly what we need. I think it's a foundational um, requirement, requisite for us to truly thrive and excel. So just acknowledging that from the beginning and prioritizing that aspect of the spatial experience. Yeah, I really love, I love that notion of like, it's not just about what we want, it's about what we need. What, what do you do, Lizzie, with clients who, or is this even a problem, but for clients who think this is kind of like a bonus uh, or something that could be cut from the budget, 
do you do you get into a like well you know yeah you could save money on this space by cutting these things from the budget but maybe it'll affect your worker productivity you know because they won't want to be there do you ever get into, have to get into conversations like that lizzie i think we do have clients where we have to prioritize the application you know not every project can have biophilia elements or features throughout the space so there are instances where we have to you know, make the case for creating these moments, these experiential moments and design features throughout our designs where it's a touch point that people can connect to. Um, but as far as, I, I mean, in my mind, it's not something that should ever be cut from the budget. I think that there is a way to contribute to that at any level of budget. And it's just more about prioritizing those touch points, understanding how you can integrate those in. Have you, uh, Sonia and, and Emmy, have you had any similar conversations where you've had to, to push for something like this? And, and if so, how did you get it over the top with the client? Yeah, well, I'll start. I, um, I just think it's crazy. Like sometimes some of the conversations we're having like you need windows? Yeah, we need windows. We need light. We need to nourish our circadian rhythms. Um, I am also, I mean, I try to be very gracious with clients and realize we're all on a path. We're all learning. We're all like, we've all kind of forgotten. We've all kind of tuned out. Um, so I think my strategy is persistence and care. And I'm not, I love research. I don't, necessarily believe that biophilic design is a checklist approach. So I won't just say you have to do this because of these reasons. But I do think the research is a really good method to just keep convincing. And I found that if you don't get everywhere on one project, if you're starting to tune into your clients and they're starting to listen, it's like, okay, the next project, we can do more. So I think we just have to be willing to show up with our clients. Yeah. It's really, that's a really important uh, No, I think you said be, being gracious. And I always try to remember with my clients, like they're not thinking about what I think about every day, all day, right? They, they're busy. They're coming from another meeting where they've been thinking about something totally different. And maybe they had a painful budget call that week and it's not top of mind. And so, yeah, it's, it's my job to kind of meet them where they're at, be gracious, like you said, and, and re-immerse them in this project, in this world, and reground them in what we're trying to achieve uh, so that it's not a like, it's not combative or it's not, you know, me lecturing them. It's, it's you know, collaborative and, and making sure they're on, we're on the same page. How about for you, Emmy? Yeah, I mean, what I was gonna say is I think a lot of, for clients that aren't necessarily proactive about incorporating biophilic strategies, I think education is a huge key. And I know Sonia mentioned, you know, research. I think one thing is, is there's a perception that it's just, you know, maybe expensive moss walls, green wall, you know, but really it, it touches on a breadth of different design strategies. And I think when you actually sit down with them to go over what these strategies look like in the space and the impact it can have for employees, for well-being, how it can enhance the, the beauty of a space. When you really sit down and understand and, and kind of walk through those and also tie them to what might be their goals for health and wellness. I mean, you don't know what their goals are until you sit down and talk with them and, and get out what what do they want to provide for their population, for their employees. Um, the more that you can tie that to the specific, you know, biophilic strategies, for example, daylighting, acoustic design. I mean, these are all things that clients are really looking at, especially post pandemic um, and are putting greater emphasis on. Um, you know, the, the less pushback you'll get, because if you try and bring it up, you know, halfway through design, it, it's not, it might not go anywhere. So <laughs> I think education is really key. For, and, for and I think education, and like you said, uh, by facilitating that conversation on goals, they, they might not have even done that thought, done that thought work ahead of time, right? So by, by always kind of bringing it back to kind of first principles and why are we here? Let's let's start with why. Uh, you know, maybe 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 that will get them to back up and realize how important these things are, just kind of on their own, right? If you're if you're having yeah. that conversation. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, you mentioned bringing it in early. That's so crucial. One of the things that we try to do with each client during our strategy process is at the very beginning, defining those goals. And it doesn't have to be so granular as the means to an end as to we're going to have moss, we're going to have a green wall. But if the vision for the space is a certain emotion or a certain experience, we try to not only have that conversation early, but reiterate that at every touch point. This is the vision. These are the goals so that we don't relinquish all of the things that contribute to those end goals. So as we're having those discussions, it's critical that the space be welcoming or it's critical that this space be inviting whatever those um, priorities are so that we can connect each of the design features back to that and really advocate and make the case for how they are getting the client to achieve their ultimate vision. And, and like you said, it's not just about a moss wall. <laughs> um, and, and I love the examples that you all showed because it, it showed a variety of different things that, that might include something like that, but that's just one element. How do you, how do you, one of the things that frustrates me a little bit with the conversation about biophilia is that sometimes it just comes down to uh, a look. It can be conveniently reduced in a blog article down to a look. How do you how do you deal with that? Um, and like, where is that kind of overlap or dovetailing between um, biophilia and sustainability for you? It's a really good question. I mean, a lot of the projects that we work on, um, you know, what we're seeing more actually is there's this tying between sustainability and health and wellness. Um, so, you know, trying to come up, there's, there's, a, there's overlaps in both. And I think you, you hit a good point. Um, I think what we typically think of is the aesthetic side of biophilia, but when we actually dive into some of the health and wellness outcomes, like all of the sensory driven um, design strategies that we can implement. Um, that's all, that all should be incorporated in the health and wellness goals and, and play into the biophilic strategies. And then in terms of the overlap between sustainability, um, I mean, one, one thing that Sonia talked about, which I thought was so key is, is taking a step back, establishing that sense of place um, driving that connection to your local, you know, your local natural world and environment. I mean, sitting in New York City, there are days when when I don't see a single um, piece of the natural landscape of New York. Um, so so it it hits home, but it, it's establishing that 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 attitude and that connection to sustainability for our projects. Um, and then you know, on granular levels, things like even materials and natural materials. Um, there's a huge sustainability impact to, to trying to find local materials, to try and find natural materials, tend to off-gas less, but you know, have recycled content. There's 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 so many different strategies that you can look at that that really synchronize with these sustainability and wellness um, strategies. I think one key is, as we talked about, identifying those early in the design and making them aligned. Um, so that they're they're really incorporated, and then the client also understands the importance of those those principles and, and feels that it meets their goals. So, how about for you, Lizzie and Sonia? So, um, Emmy, you talked about early engagement and bringing owners on, and I do agree. I think that's critical. Um, my favorite approach that I think is most effective is early engagement workshops. And I'm not talking about the workshops where I come into the room and I tell the team what to do or I have all the answers. Um, I learned this working on a lot of living building challenge projects is that um, there is power and impact in co-creating and partnership. And that means like interdisciplinary and it's everyone from as broad of a group as you can get, right? From contractors to owners, to people that will be using the building, um, to manufacturers, to designers, to um, nonprofits in the area, just sitting around and really being intentional about what is the essence of this place. And what happens is people have that intelligence. They kind of have that knowing. They can kind of create these ideas together, especially as they are envisioning that possibility and that potential of who's gonna be in that place. 
and bringing that healing to it. And that way it's not fragmented. That way it is, um, Lizzie, you were talking about whole self. I think that's how we get to the point of whole self. And I think when we do that early in the process, then there is buy-in and the team is willing to kind of carry that forward in new and unique ways. I, I really personally use a lot of workshops and co-creation in, in my work as well. And, and you know, I've been doing this, this is my 25th year as a professional designer. And I, I think the longer I do it, the more, the less it is about me and, and the more it is about the people I'm collaborating with. And you just never, one, you never know where a good idea is going to come from. And that's, I have no uh, preference to it coming from me. I'd, I'd rather have it come from someone else and then for myself to kind of dust that off and, and turn it into something. Uh, and two, like the sense of ownership from the client is so high then because they were they were in the room when the magic happened, kind of. And I, I would just say like connecting this back to product and some of the product we saw early on, I think one of the untapped um, potentials of biophilic design is when we can marry function and the beauty and the natural aesthetic. Like that to me is the real impact. Yeah, I think it's like that everything has to work hard in a design, right? So if there's a, a, a wall element, it's like, how can it be beautiful? Of course, but also how can it do something else for me? Like have an acoustic benefit uh, and then have a sustainable aspect, right? Like that's our goal is to make the, the individual things work hard. Well, I think, so you asked about the connection to sustainability and it does feel like sustainability has been a forefront conversation topic for so many years that it has started to become more foundational. We have built trust and partnership with manufacturers and products that we know are manufactured sustainably, but it seems like the conversation with time has shifted from not just what what can reduce the negative impact, but what can provide a positive impact? So it's not just that it's a low emitting product, but it, in a biophilic element, is it actually providing an air purifying quality? Or in an acoustic product, is it actually providing a better cognitive or mental and emotional experience in the space? So it's more that it has to cross that line from not being bad to really contributing in a good way. Yeah. And of course, even, I mean, we joked about moss walls, but, but, you know, a moss wall is going to do all those things, right? It is, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to produce oxygen and, and help filter the air. It's also going to have an acoustic benefit as well. So um, it's nice to find those things. So, so Lizzie, you're, you're, you're finding some of that pull from the clients for those things. They're, 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 they're looking for that. So I think the shift that I've seen for my own clients is moving away from the organizational goals and really leaning into the personal experience. There is so much competition and so much, you know, just really competing for attraction and retention of the best talent and trying to bring people back from the pandemic and into a public environment where they want to be. And first and foremost, the people are the main attraction. But how do you create an environment where those people want to spend time? You touched on that at the beginning. And so that's really where we're seeing the main focus at this time in our projects is how are we creating that more neurodivergent experience that's appealing to all facets of the population, not just the status quo. And it, it's not a one size fits all. Our spaces have more choice, more variety, more diversity of finishes, um, and then more diversity of all of the sensory experiences, you know, creating quiet zones that are more intentional that comes with not only the design, but operational practices. So it, it's this very layered, much more complex approach than what we've seen from clients historically. And it feels like they're listening and it's exciting. Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, you know, all three of you have, have mentioned it. Uh, in terms of this kind of like these experiential goals, um, and you call it kind of sensory goals, which I really loved. And it really reminded me of this one big company I used to work for, the cafeteria, but had this really shallow dome to it. And it was it was a big space, could hold a few hundred people. And it was beautiful. I mean, you're in this kind of domed space with indirect lighting pointing up to the dome. But the way it, such it was designed, where if you sat at the edge of the dome, 
you could hear a conversation from the total other edge of the dome, like they were whispering right in your ear. And I mean, it, it, was, it just, it was very frustrating. Plus you had to be really careful about what you said in there. <laughs> uh, but, but you can imagine just not designed for someone who could be very easily distracted or could be a very frustrating space. And so um, obviously we're an acoustics company. So we like to hear that, that designers are, are thinking about that sensory experience from the get-go because that company was saddled with that with that uh, cafeteria for 25 years before they fixed it so um i think we're at the point now where we should open up do we have a lot of do we have any q uh some any questions in the chat if any of you have any questions uh feel free to add them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to get to them I, I should have said that much earlier yeah no that's okay yeah. um yeah if, if there are any questions uh please do drop them into the chat uh, but i don't know if you want to ask another question we'll just see if um you know how they populate yeah, cool. um, I I guess selfishly I I would love to hear uh, from from the three of you how you know how you are playing with those sensory elements and and uh, how acoustics kind of plays into it because we're we're always trying to develop products uh, to better serve what what you need uh, and and we want to make sure we're we're doing things that uh, making things that you can play with to create new spaces and places. And go ahead, Lizzie. So, so for me, we're more often um, trying to create features or elements that speak to multiple sensory experiences so that it's not only the visual impact. Some of those, um, the new Curie ink products have such beautiful prints, but it's also the fact that it's a textural material and that you're not just getting flat paint or a printed film in the space. Um, that that carries into a lot of things, but another example would be a water feature that's not only beautiful to look at, but it has that soft, soothing sound. Um, it sort of mentally allows you to linger for a moment, refocus your attention. So thinking about how do we create features that have more than one experience, not just the visual impact, but something additional. Yeah, I mean, a water feature is basically like a white noise machine, right? So it's so, so nice to have something like that that's organic and has movement and sound and obviously brings a natural feeling into things. Yeah, I was going to say that's such a unique and, and, and amazing product when it comes to uh, looking at acoustic and biophilic strategies related to acoustic design. Um, I think we tend to think about like the priority, especially this has been elevated by like return to work is how do we protect acoustic privacy, especially in these open office floor plans. So that's designing spaces where almost like refuge spaces where you can enter into a more private acoustic zone. And I think what kind of playing off what Lizzie was saying, like pairing that with other objectives and elements, whether that's the, um, you know, from, from an aesthetic standpoint, having textures, having biophilic designs to, to kind of touch both the acoustic design piece and the biophilic, you know, visual piece. Um, another thing that I think is is such an opportunity to um, with with um, Carry Ink, it's the printing piece, um, printing patterns. There's so many incredible biomorphic and um, you know fractal patterns that are that are known to have these incredible impacts on on our on our health and well being. Um, so so when you compare that performance, the acoustic design piece with the with the biophilic you know more visual pieces, I think that's such an incredible thing. And also you know, I think it'll be interesting. I'd love to see more in, in projects moving forward, utilizing natural sounds. So um, even the presence, like a rippling stream or um, even just the sound of wind hitting a surface, like all of these things are things that we experience in our in a natural environment that we we seek out. So I'd love to see how products and how design can, can kind of incorporate more, more of those acoustic um, strategies. Being it from Portland, I have to get like my little Portlandia takes in there. But the <laughs> Portland, uh, airport PDX has won like best airport like seven years in a row in America. And they just put in this new installation. There's this really long and glass uh, causeway that's, you know, it's loud and echoey. Uh, and in, instead of trying to fight it, um, what they did was they did this like installation on like birds of the Pacific Northwest. And then there's like bird sounds from the 
from the Pacific Northwest. And now, and now the, the reverberation actually becomes a feature and you're like, oh, just like hearing birds in the airport. It's so cool. And just with such a clever way. Uh, with the printing, I was super excited to see like in other industries as well, you know, in hospitality, in education. Uh, I think we just feel like the custom printing is going to give you all such a such a cool tool to play with um, to, to bring kind of unique experiences to people. Yeah, I think the um, strategies like the custom printing also helps us to really be place based and be essence, you know, kind of be essence focused with our work. Um, the other thing I would add from kind of a multi-sensory perspective, which is a little more upstream, like how do we get people to really tune into what that experience should be? Lizzie talked a lot about that experience and really tuning into that. Um, one of the ways I like to do that is again, in workshops without just saying we're doing biophilic design strategies, but like open the group up to understanding their own biophilic relationships, right? And make it about the senses so that the team, when they're thinking and they're envisioning and they're partnering and working together, they're already kind of tuned into that. And they're looking at the site or the project in this way that is about the experiences. So, and I, I think to me, why that matters is, again, as designers, I don't think we want to be really fragmented and just trying to get prod products on projects for, you know, maybe disconnected reasons, but to be really intentional with it. Um, because I think as we start to move towards this interest and want to create multi-sensory in the space, I think we also really want to be focusing on helping to kind of calm the senses because there's so much going on in our cities and in our world that I think part of it is, is maybe kind of just calming that nervous sense system or that sensory system so just tuning in yeah and Sonia do you do you see any like different approaches to that between kind of workplace and hospitality and education and healthcare, or do you see a, a convergence or is it just kind of case by case what, what are your thoughts there um I would say it's definitely case by case however um, because I see every project and design opportunity as unique but they share some patterns. I mean, certainly when we go into healthcare, you know, we're looking for thinking about the vulnerable, thinking about the fatigue of the caregivers. We go into academia, it's a, it's a different experience for the students and the staff and the faculty. I mean, again, that's where I'm like, I, if I had one message out there for, you know, the design industry is just to not, not think of it as a prescriptive approach and really trying to tune into that experience in the people. I like that. Michael, we do have one question in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's from Nicole. It says, for your projects, does biophilic design and biomimicry ever get to meet beyond moss walls? And have an answer for Nicole. I've always wanted them to. <laughs> um, I've worked with some biomimicry um, uh, resources and here at Arizona State, the uh, Janine Benyes, the Center for Biomimicry, is is housed here for graduate studies. Um, I feel like it's been more like um, kind of some partnerships on products and thinking in that way, but I don't think it's ever really. I, I think there's opportunity there. Hoping some of the panelists have a, a better reference than I do. I'm in the same position of wanting them to meet, but not having to, not having had the chance to really dig deep into that. Um, so I don't have a better solution, but yes, to say, I think there are products that have a much stronger connection to natural patterns and biomimicry specific products, but it's been a challenge to get to that level of elevated conversation with the client that they have the appreciation that we want to bring that to the table. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good question. I think it also it it, it depends on, you know, I think as we're trying to to bring biophilia to the conversation earlier in projects and not make it kind of a reactive strategy. Um it 
all those biomimicry strategies, like for example, something something I think is so important and that we're trying to see is that dynamicity. So for example, a strategy where you can see how uh, the impact of seasons changing, how do you do that in, in an interior space or how, you know, what are kind of the strategies that work for your project depending on like location and the scope of work. So it's a, it's a great question. I think it's something that as we start to really incorporate like biophilia in our, in our beginning, in the beginning of the project with our stakeholders, um, it, it's a, it's a piece that we need to bridge together with, with the holistic biophilic strategy. So. I think it's one of the, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, okay. One of the things that we have seen an increase of, which is different over these past years is the emphasis on having an outdoor space, a literal physical connection to nature. And many more of our clients now have their own dedicated terrace or exterior workspace it's directly linked and connected to their interior space. And I love that opportunity. So it's less abstract and more literal, but I do think we've had more opportunities for that and that extension of offices and workplaces to the outdoors. That's a really, that's a really great point. And so Kira's parent company is a company called Carnegie that makes uh, bio-based textiles. And they just launched an outdoor collection last year, which is their first uh, outdoor product and it's totally plant-based, uh, but, but it's super high performance. And with that notion of like, there's just a lot more blending between indoor and outdoor. Um, even the hotel we stayed at last time we were here in New York city, the, the motto has this huge outdoor terrace, but it just kind of like seamlessly blends into the indoor. And so, yeah, you're like, how do you make all that work is so important. Kind of a little bit of a side quest on the biomimicry. Sorry, Anne, to quote you. Uh, but uh, I, I love this. I think with biomimicry, it's not, there's sometimes the really obvious things, but then there's the interesting kind of system-wide inspirations. And I highly recommend uh, a little bit of a tangent, the documentary, I think it's called uh, The Biggest Little Farm, about this, this couple from LA, I think, who bought a farm and tried to make it like super basically super natural farm like old old world and they had these these uh i think citrus trees um and then they're like you know between the citrus trees they planted like herbs and steppables to have like natural composting but that that attracted snails and so then they got ducks to eat the snails and then the ducks were laying eggs so then they got into the egg business and it's just super inspiring to see how every problem they found that a very natural solution and how kind of like nature self-organizes basically. And we, we as humans usually mess up that self-organization, but also we can be inspired by it to, to put things back. I was going to say, I'm looking forward to seeing how, uh, very quickly, how um, products can help in terms of biomimicry. I know there, there's all these, these, new materials, more bio-based, like for example, using seaweed as an application in, in wall structures and um, all this interesting research that I think is, is starting to gain a lot of traction. And we're hoping to see it scale too, to, to try and implement it in, in projects, so. Yeah, this Carnegie textile is actually made from sugar cane that's then processed into a sugar cane based, basically tape, and then that's woven into the material. Um, but it's, you know, you can clean it like plastic, basically, like wine would just run right off of it. So it is really interesting to see, and it's, but it's been a multi-year development to get to that, right? To, you know, there's so much yeah. work that goes into making that product. Right. Okay, I think we're uh, about ready to wrap it up. Uh, it's uh, 9.58 on the West Coast, so that's 12.58 out here. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, the panelists. This was an amazing conversation. Uh, I wish we could go on for another hour or two, uh, but we'll just wrap it up here. So thank you again. Um, if you have any questions on Cure, uh, you can visit our website. We have uh, more information on Cure, acoustics, PET, our sustainability practices. Um, you can request samples, um, get materials and products. Um, we're also on Material Bank, so if you need that overnight a little bit quicker, um, you can go on Material Bank and make those requests. Um, on the website, you can also connect with a rep. 
You can download BIM elements. We have BIM elements, uh, Revit files for all of our products along with our sustainability documentation and other specification tools. Um, and while you're there, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we send out um, updates on our company and our products and our practices. Um, so you can stay tuned to that. Um, and if you're more interested in Cure Inc., uh, we do have this digital lookbook available. Um, so if you go to curausa.com forward slash ink dash lookbook, it'll take you right there. Dan, if you want to go to the next slide for me. One of the things we do for every launch um, is put together a little playlist. Um, and so this is 100% original. Uh, so Michael puts this together for our team and we listen to it during development as we're you know, working on products and um, the marketing materials and everything. Um, so this is a great playlist to listen to while you work. Um, there's some David Bowie, Arcade Fire, Kimbra. Um, check it out. We do have several playlists. We have one for each launch. So if you need something to, to listen to, something new, check those out. I always try to put in some hidden meanings in the song selection. So you can try to infer for what you will, but it's uh, being a child of the of the 80s and 90s and making mixtapes. So sorry. <laughs> awesome. And then finally, don't forget to connect with us. Um, we are on social channels. Uh, so we're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Pinterest. So please check us out, follow us, um, and continue the conversation online. Again, we really appreciate everyone being here today, our wonderful panelists, our awesome hosts. Um, thank you to Deanne, and again, all of you for joining us. We will be sending this out in a recording afterward. Um, so stay tuned for that and have an awesome day. Thanks, everybody.